Hi, I'm Gina Louise Shara. I'm the mayor of Northampton, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the second meeting about the Resilience Hub. Um, the, tonight it's titled Resilience and Relationships Strengthening Downtown. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I see some folks that were here last time. I see some new faces. I hope that many of you just got a chance to go and actually see the building and be inside, um, which uh, we pretty much, when people go inside, they are kind of amazed and I think they start to see what we all see. So I hope you had that opportunity. If you didn't, um, we will make sure that there are more opportunities. Um, our first meeting that we had in March, we focused on high level vision for the project, the building's history, um, our hopes for the site, and we looked at similar projects in other communities for context for what we're envisioning doing. Since then, uh, we had a great chance to tour the building with its most immediate neighbors and abutters, um, whose homes and businesses are right uh, around the building. Um, and then we had a chance to sit down with them and have um, a conversation and hear their thoughts on how we can be most successful in planning and how um, we can all work together as a community around that. So tonight we're gonna focus on the broader context around the need for the hub, how it will make progress on downtown climate resilience, public health and safety, and emergency preparedness. So while an important goal of the hub is to focus assistance on our vulnerable populations in Northampton, from houselessness to heating assistance, it will also address many of our other community needs by contributing to environmental resilience, downtown planning, and public health. Um, so with that introduction and that welcome, and again, thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Dory Brooks, our very capable architect, not only of the property, but also community conversation that would happen around this concept and idea for the Hub, um, since it's a very first time we started talking about it. So here's Dory. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again for coming. Um, I, uh, I want to let you know, uh, first off, that we're going to actually have to cover some of what we covered in the first conversation, because I'm sure some people didn't see some of what we talked about. So just to start off, can I see a show of hands of who was here last time? Wow, okay, great, this is wonderful. So unfortunately, you will have to sit through some repetition because we wanna be sure everyone is on the same page. I'll try my hardest not to pace as much so that we can kind of keep track of it. Uh, a couple uh, housekeeping tasks first. I wanna thank Edwards Church for, for allowing us to use this beautiful space and uh, central uh, services and uh, the mayor's office for helping to orchestrate tours of the building. I know that's probably made a huge difference. We should have done it before the first conversation because now I think people understand the, the community potential of the building. So that's really exciting. I also want to mention if there's anyone who has any need for Spanish translation, we can provide those services. If you raise a hand, we can be sure we have a translator available to assist. Um, and uh, again, as uh, we talked about, this. Tonight's goal is, is not only to catch everyone up on this uh, schematic design progress, but also to put it in the context of, of other issues. So we're, we've, we've pressured our, our wonderful, talented city staff to come and take all the great knowledge they have that is just automatic to them and make it super transparent to the rest of us so we can understand how the, the hub fits in the context of planning, climate, and public health. So um, thank you for enduring our request. Um, so we'll talk further. Um, I'm going to just run through some basic information to be sure everyone is aware of what we're talking about first. So again, this is um, the second of uh, three um, presentations that we're going to make during this early design phase. We'll also come back later and, and catch people up as we come closer to construction. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that the third conversation is really going to very specifically look at issues of homelessness and the resources around homelessness in Northampton and mapping all the different agencies and, and really addressing that issue of overlap of services and how that service integration has been a driver for this project from day one. Um, also, for anybody who would like to learn more about this or, or wants to go back and look at some of the previous information, um, we have a QR code and a website, uh, Northampton Community Resilience Hub.org. Um, Community Action Fire Valley is helping us to keep that populated with updates and information, so please feel free to look at that at any time. You can also sign up at that website if you'd like to get information as we continue to expand the project. Uh, so, again, just 
basic information here. What the heck is a resilience hub? <laughs> so a resilience hub, the idea of a real resilience hub is that it's a building or infrastructure that helps to enable the community to, to be able to manage uh, an environmental or, or public health or emergency of some kind. You know, so we are seeing an increase in the number of emergencies that we're facing. How can we kind of anticipate that by providing the resources, having them in place to support the community through such an event? So that's the idea about resilience hubs, especially in relation to climate. But every resilience hub in the country is going to look different based on the community it's in. So our resilience hub has always been intended to be designed also to simultaneously work to support um, acute economic needs on a day-to-day -day basis. So to provide a day center for those who are without uh, shelter or are in need of food and assistance on a daily basis. So it's a, it's a two-pronged goal. Uh, so we have ultimately three prongs because we talked last week a lot about community as well. But we want to coordinate access and support. We want to provide resilience in the event of an emergency. And we want to provide a strengthened community. So essentially supporting those socially vulnerable in the community who may not be able to handle the challenges of a, a flooding event, a power outage, by being sure those resources are there. And the goal is to make the community space so welcoming that everyone is comfortable going there when they need it, because we're all ultimately facing challenges. We're all one, one healthcare crisis away from needing services in some way. So that's the, the intent is that we're all in this together, and how can we be sure that we're supporting each other through these, these concerns? So unusual um, compared to other buildings is the idea of designing a building that is prepared for these other events. So what does it mean to be a resilient building? It's meaning that we're preparing the building to be able to stand without power, to be sure that it loses heat and cooling slowly because it's well insulated, to be sure it has adequate water, um, to support needs uh, for anyone who might need a shower. Um, so being sure that we have some of those resources there to really kind of pad and support throughout uh, the project. So that's different than my house, <laughs> which would, would not be able to sustain itself for very long. So. Uh, that flip is an interesting challenge, and it's one of the things that's so interesting about designing. So when you're in the building, and those of you who went into the building, you can imagine that sanctuary as being a public hall, a community event, first night event. It can be used for so many positive things throughout the year. But in the event of a crisis, it can also provide 30 shelter cots in that sanctuary space. So that, that gives us extra resiliency in the event that uh, a neighborhood in town is, is under duress. So that's, that's the basic concept that we're working with. Um, again, our goal here is to have these conversations in order to implement the community's ideas and be sure the community is thinking about how the resilience are going to be operating. So again, this has been a coalition-led process. It began uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, and then we joined, Joan Swinson Architects joined in uh, 2020 uh, at, in helping to convene conversations amongst different agencies and departments around what this might look like and set goals and follow through with those goals. In the process that we're in now, our work has been to focus on the key anchor partners thus far who have been helping us to define the early phases of the project design, the program parameters, the systems needs, in order to get a real scope and scale of the project and its, uh, its ambitions clear, um, and then also to start talking about it in the community so that it can be refined and further uh, expanded on. Uh, so Community Action Pioneer Valley, MANA, Department of Community Care, Hilltown Health and the Emergency Management Services in the city have been our key resources in this early phase of design. Uh, but as you can see, all these other agencies have been part of the conversation and leading up and sort of advocating for this project from the beginning. So last time we met, we had conversation here about a lot of specific things. And what we heard were a lot of interest and awareness sorry, about the uh, the day center use, which was wonderful to hear. So many people were already looking to see that happen. Um, we also heard people curious to know more about climate action and how this relates to our climate, sorry, step back, <laughs> our climate goals in the city and see how, what, it, what does it mean for it to be a resilient building. Uh, we also heard concern from people who live near the building or, or have offices near there about traffic and access, acknowledging that that is a challenge, 
how do you create something in a very tight urban environment that then also has parking? Well, that was unfortunately always a concern with this site, is that it's a walkable location for on, on purpose because the majority of people who are likely to need those services are within the downtown area. So being sure it's within the downtown was always important, but admittedly this is a concern for people, so we wanted to be sure that we talked about that. Um, the, we did follow up, as, as the mayor said, and we had meetings with the butters afterwards, and we'll continue to have conversations to be sure that they're aware of how the design is progressing. And we'll do that more. We heard people ask about water supply, which was actually a great comment. We've been designing the water, just kind of scoping out the loads. We went back and took a look at that and thought, okay, actually, you know, it's legitimately, this could be a real concern. Let's be sure we have adequate water supply, um, hot water uh, heating capacity for the building. Um, we heard people wanted to see in the building, so it was great that we were able to do that. Um, a lot of people were curious about the geothermal aspect of the project. Ben is going to talk a little bit just to let you know more about the importance of that. But uh, we, we have done a test well to um, find out whether we could provide uh, geothermal to support the, the heating and cooling, and that is a capability um, in the area. Well, that test well was done at Forbes Library with the intent that potentially the building and Forbes Library could potentially benefit from geothermal wells. Um, and then we also discussed program ideas for what, what could happen in the hub. Uh, so just quick overview again of the plans. I know a lot of people were over there just now asking what's going to happen, can you show us? So this is just a quick review of where we stand currently in concept for what would happen where in the building. So at the first floor level, as you can see, even in this section, that community hall, former sanctuary space is gargantuan, right? So it's a high as this, but a much broader space. So it, it reads very dramatically in this section. Um, the intent is that major hall um, could serve many, many purposes. On the first floor level, though, the idea is that there would be a, a commercial kitchen and a, a dining space that could serve 80 tables, 80 people seating at tables, um, as well as a day center, some outreach offices to support people and, and kind of provide health access within that space, um, and some laundry, toilets, and shower facilities. So that is a whole self-contained floor with its own operations going on. You can sort of see here, we've tried to show um, three potential medical clinic spaces, two office spaces, and then some supportive spaces for things like clothing, um, just access and communication. Uh, again, that main floor, both of these floors would be accessible, um, so neither would require an elevator to get to. They're both accessible at the street level, and you'll see more about that in the site plan. Uh, but that main hall, which is so stunning when you walk into it, the city's decision was to keep that as a civic space and to make it as multifunctional, multi-useful as possible. So the sloping floor will be leveled so that it can support a variety of different activities. It could be a seated audience, it could be a standing audience, uh, it could be a gallery space, it could be used for, you know, kind of cafe tables, you could have language courses, uh, you could gather for uh, a large meeting, small meetings, you know, you could do many different things in the space, and that's the intent, is to keep it as, as multi-purpose as possible, provide some communications technology and lighting to allow it to be shifted to a performance space as necessary. Um, and then behind that space, there are a, a significant area that could support offices. So the intent is different meetings, meeting room size and small office consult spaces that would be flexible. So different groups could use the space to meet with clients. Uh, some of our social service agencies want to not necessarily have a permanent footprint, they might want to have a, a once a week footprint. So they'd be able to plop, you know, come in to, to meet with people and set hours. So it allows for that variety. Um, and then you have uh, additional storage that we'll carve out um, to support the resilience aspect of the project, um, as well as to support some of the different users of the building. Uh, and then on the, the third floor, which is smaller because the sanctuary is two-story height, um, is a space that's dedicated now to DCC's operations, so they have eight staff. Some will be on the first floor, some will be on the third floor. Um, so those are not uh, office at, offices that people will be visiting. There is an elevator, so it's possible that people could be visiting that floor, but in general it's seen as a private office location and also private storage to support uh, dispatch for DCC and some of the emergency management needs for the, the building. Um, 
And here's an exciting moment. You know, we've tried to render what the exterior would look like because I think people don't imagine the exterior. The intent there is to, to extend the public plaza from the building to the street, uh, to the sidewalk. And remember, the sidewalk is all being revised as a part of uh, uh, the downtown redesign. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of, of how that almost becomes another space. So it's large enough to support, um, you know, a performance area outside, a gathering space. Cathedral in the night could conceptually, you know, have some of their events here. So we've talked to them about what their needs are for power, um, being sure we have water access out here and things like that. So we've already started to work towards those detailed designs. What, what's most important is the efforts and the conversations around access to the building. We've really spent a lot of time thinking about how to open up the access to the day center so that no one has to walk in the streets or walk on the other property across the alley um, from the building. So it's, we have an, an accessible route along the sidewalk to the site and then an accessible route all the way to that door and back again. So And, and making sure that feels open and inviting and well lit. Um, so that's, that's a lot of what we've been working on. Um, there will be changes as we go. We, we put in the blasting glass to give people a sense of what that would feel like when it was back in the building. Um, again, from above, this gives you a, a better sense of how that's going to relate. This is all being kind of reshaped, um, and this public, the property actually stops there at the flat part of the wall. Um, the rest is actually uh, the public way. Um, and then again, this entry to the, the day center and how that might, might look and feel with a ramp down to it. Uh, so, overview project schedule. We've been very <laughs> ambitious in presenting a schedule. I would not, you know, take it to the bank yet because <laughs> there's a lot that has to happen to make this project a, a reality. But from a design perspective, we're going to continue on in the design work. Um, and then we envision a 12-month construction schedule once the project is, is cleared for construction. But that could change based on, on a lot of factors you know, in terms of it could be done in phases. You know, so, but there's a real sense of urgency about getting that first floor open and operating. However, all the systems have to be working in the building for the first floor to operate. So, So we have been through the schematic design phase where, we, again, we worked with the, the, the principal partners of the project to get enough information to start really um, honing out the scope and scale of the project. We're now entering design development. Important in design development for us is actually starting to really understand each of the uh, systems and all the material decisions that will go into the project. So we will now, in this phase, speak more directly to the variety of users that will be in the building. So this is not the only outreach that we're doing, it's just the most public outreach, but we'll be doing uh, uh, work through the different agencies to actually speak to seniors, people with disabilities, um, veterans, trying to really kind of understand some of the different uh, conditions uh, that make people welcome, feel welcome and, and received well by the building. So that we're, we're doing our very best to be sure that this is a, a broadly received, broadly uh, used public building. So. Uh, so, again, there's probably more questions around all of those, but we wanted to stop before we go into the context information that the staff are going to share um, to give an opportunity for people to ask questions, because we have a lot of really great content I'm really excited to hear, but I want to be sure that we've, we've answered your questions specifically about the schematic design. Yes? Do you have a start time? You don't have a start time for the construction yet? Ideally, ideally, in my ma imaginary world, uh, we would actually be uh, we would be done with design by you know January of this coming year, and then it would be 12 months of construction. That's the ideal world. If 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 everything were ready to go, we would do that. Um, partly, you want to kind of keep moving on these types of projects because the longer they stall, the longer the more expensive they become. So, so what is there a budget? Um, we just have provided all the information um, and gotten started the, the cost estimating process and are bringing that back to the city. And the city will have to make some choices about that. We've been very practical about it. If you walk through the building, you saw there's a lot of work done. But this is a very ambitious goal for a project to have a, an emergency generator that will support it for three days, to um, have that level of resiliency within the building systems. Um, to be sure it's well insulated, it's a historic building. So there are elements of the building 
that the city has to kind of weigh how far to go in some of these choices. Um, so that information is kind of underway, and probably by the next meeting we'll be able to answer questions about cost a little bit more clearly. Yes. working with uh, the different agencies that are their advocates for the homeless um, in order to identify people to speak with. And we, we did this similarly when we were working on uh, behalf of um, Valley Community Development. Um, we met with different um, folks in permanent supportive housing to talk about their experiences. And we're kind of tying some of this work all together to talk about not just how, how might you use a building, but also what or your vulnerabilities, you know, in face of challenges like flooding and, and and when something happens, how are you experiencing it? So that we can actually kind of get deeper knowledge that can inform the design. So yeah, we have we intend to um, meet with people in a very. I find personally, I come from a background of doing one-on-one -on -one investigation, which I find more useful than than kind of large groups. So that's how we've asked to, to structure it: is to try and identify um, smaller numbers of people to do one-on-one -on -one interviews with. A big cross section of people. Yes? I wonder if you could say something about the general budget for this and whether the funding is going to potentially delay construction. Um, I will not. <laughs> so, um, I mean, in general, I mean, I, I you know, I, it's really, um, do you want to answer a question about funding? I feel like I'm in ter dangerous territory, right? Because to get ahead of anybody on this. So, like, we are just now, um, thanks. Could you take the mic? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alan Wolf, I'm the Mayor's Chief of Staff. We have just very recently learned some very initial stuff that's all very contingency if we do X or if we do Y, if we, and we're trying to figure out exactly what the configuration will be. We haven't even really presented it to the mayor yet. It's very fresh, uh, and we're just not ready yet to say this is how much. Um, and it's obviously a very sensitive conversation given the context of budgeting in the city. So we want to make sure that when we present this information that we're really ready to go and we're ready to stand behind the pieces because there's a whole lot of options for what we might or might not include in this and what gets in a phase one or if it can be happening all at once. Also, we've asked a lot of people for a lot of money recently, and if that comes in, then it gets a whole lot easier to think about what gets included and what doesn't. So, I promise it's coming, but I mean, the truth is I really, we have not even talked to my boss yet about what this is gonna cost. So, stay tuned, please. Yes. Hi, um, City Councilor Mary question, please. Um, I'm into disability 100%. Are all the bathrooms going to be accessible? Uh, um, there will be accessible stalls within every bathroom. Um, there, there will be bathrooms that have multiple stalls. Some will not be accessible, some will be. So there will be multiple accessible locations within the building for sure, yes. Coming into building. Yes. Where is it accessible for wheelchairs? So it, is that off to the side? It will be. So right now it's not, if we go back to that site plan, so even here, so uh, or this is probably a starting point. So that accessible ramp will get you to this doorway which will be accessible and the entire first floor will be accessible. And on the upper side, oh sorry, that's actually good. On this side, you'll enter at this door, it will be made accessible and the entire second floor will be accessible. And there's an elevator connecting all of the floors. So, yeah. Great, perfect. Then, uh, <laughs> then we can move on because we have a lot of wonderful information to share. So I'm gonna pass the baton to Carolyn. Mike, really close. <laughs> um, good afternoon, evening. Um, it's good to see you all here. I am just going to go briefly. I think there were some comments um, at the last meeting about understanding 
um, the background of sort of where planning fits in all of this and where we are. And it's, I'm going to be very quick because from the planning perspective, so we've done a lot of the foundational work and worked with the community about what's important in terms of um, sustainability for our community. And now this is sort of a project phase, and so there's a lot more detail about, um, and I'm sure all of you are really interested in about how this project will function. So um, just, let me make sure I have this correct. Okay, great. So we adopted, the community um, adopted the Sustainable Northampton Climate Resilience and Regeneration Plan about three years ago. It was an update from the Sustainable Northampton Plan. But the focus sort of is planning for resilience has a number of components which um, are all sort of um, going to be reflected in this, in this wonderful project that we're planning now. But we t in, in the plan, there's sort of all these components that are interwoven and connected. Um, this plan talks about goals and objectives um, and guiding principles for how we're going to be a more sustainable community what kind of, um, and with a social equity lens, and how we make sure that we're addressing um, opportunities and challenges for all the members of our community. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. How do we get there, and what kinds of things do these look like? What, how do you go from the planning process to the specific project? So, you know, in this, um, in our plan, we have, there's environmental, um, um, guiding principles, and that's about um, the environment, meaning the built environment, as well as the natural environment, and the connectivity between those, and how do we get people, um, you know, housed and um, connected um, to um, other, you know, downtown spaces, um, and, and do that all in, the, in a, a lens of equity. Um, so first, talking about social equity, you know, Guiding principles are supporting in, um, and investing in um, diverse communities and um, integrating the community and addressing environmental justice and injustices from the past, um, building resilience and regeneration um, for all of us, as I mentioned. Um, and that includes supporting um, different um, infrastructure, housing, providing housing opportunities for, for people across the, spec, uh, across the spectrum in our community, um, and also how we get there in terms of what, how are we investing or how are we creating, setting up the framework for that. So, you know, there's some examples here of um, sort of multiple ways we're addressing um, housing and social equity in the upper right corner is a now dated picture of the Moose Lodge. Um, next to the Broadbrook Coalition um, um, <laughs> conservation area. So we want to make sure we're, um, when we think about housing and housing for all, that we're also intentional about ensuring that everyone has access to our natural resources and to um, commercial spaces and um, that it's walkable and bikeable. So um, that's an example of a project that's forthcoming. Um, and then the lower right corner, I think, um, We'll recognize some people in that photo, but again, sort of supporting all uh, our partners um, who are building housing. So this is a, a wall raising for Habitat. Um, and so we support, um, even though we set the planning up and we talk about housing, we talk about where it's important to have housing, um, but also the next step is um, um, working with partners to make, to realize those, um, um, those outcomes. Um, and so, in talking about economic and cultural um, vitality, we want to um, recognize our history and our buildings and how those can be flexible and we reuse those buildings for different um, opportunities. And so, the hub is an example of that where we're transitioning a historic structure that had been um, a place of um, worship and, and, and faith based, and now it's going to be realizing you know, a new life and new vigor and to support um, uh, um, functions that will, um, as Dory was mentioning, sort of um, address needs for the people who are most vulnerable in our community, but also the community as a whole with, um, you know, arts and culture space and 
create sort of a new vibrant center at one end of our downtown. Um, and that's another sort of example of how we um, want to support that sort of transition in, in both buildings and spaces to accommodate um, changing needs of the community. Um, and so looking at um, environmental security and sustainability, um, again, sort of thinking about walkability and, um, and, and connectivity and creating opportunities for people both who may, um, by choice, not um, want to always be in their car to get from place to place or um, may not have the opportunity to own a vehicle that gets them from place to place. So we want to make sure we're addressing a transportation need, but also um, understanding that um, we have a huge, um, we can make a huge dent in our impact um, on our community by trying to reduce some of those trips. So we're trying to adopt more sustainable land use patterns and those connectivities between um, land uses and, of course, protect our natural resources and our agricultural resources. So um, investments in um, permanent protection of open space that are accessible to a wide variety of um, residents in the community and also creating that infrastructure for people to, to access. Um, oops. Um, I think I, these slides may have, oops, I'm gonna go back. I just wanna finish up by um, saying um, that there are a number of projects, a number of ways that we, um, in um, the planning, um, in our space um, that we can help actualize these goals and objectives and guiding principles. And so we can do that through infrastructure investment, through um, financing, so through get grants and allocation of resources, um, helping to develop housing and economic development, um, and then infrastructure improvement. So as it relates to the hub, um, some of the projects we've been working on to support um, the most vulnerable in our community and also just um, develop um, housing where it makes sense is to set up a regulatory framework for where we want housing, what we want it to look like, and that's based on community input. Um, and then we can then further that by investing in through grants. So for example, 27 Crafts Avenue, which is not a building yet, but we're working, um, we have a grant through the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program um, to, um, and Jones Woodson of Architects is our partner on that as well, to develop um, 30 units of um, housing for very low income folks, people coming off of homelessness. So that's a, um, that is also connected to sort of this resource hub that we're creating at the end of at this end of Main Street. So thinking about um, connecting those services and those new, that new housing opportunity for people and, and, and creating a complete um, sort of sphere of support for that. So that's the way that um, the city sort of helps to realize that component of the plan. Um, there are other projects such as um, the redesign of Main Street or Picture Main Street where that's really focused on um, creating new opportunities for vibrancy and connectivity and making it a safe walking and bikeable corridor to and from downtown but through downtown. And so that project um, will, the start of that project, if you will, is on the west end of um, Main Street here is at the doors of, of this new hub. And so there'll be that connection through downtown and um, what that does is it's, it's not, it means we're not separating this building from the community, but it's really part of downtown and um, will be easily and safely accessible um, from anywhere in downtown, but also um, from the side streets as we, again, sort of invest in infrastructure. And then other projects, just to touch on that, in terms of economic development, um, we're working um, hard to try to find a buyer for 33 King Street, which is the old probate court. Um, so again, sort of looking at that opportunity for um, enhancing the um, vibrancy of downtown, adding new opportunities for economic development and housing potentially. Um, so again, helping to um, 
to continue that um, sort of ever transitioning um, downtown character. So, um, I think the next thing we're jumping into health, is that right? Taking questions? Sure. Is any of this affected by uh, the, the historic district that starts right around that area? The historic district. You mean the, um, the, the redesign the, for the hub? The hub. Um, no. So um, the historic district um, for Elm Street is basically on this side from the um, St. Mary's Church west of Elm Street. And that's really um, comes into play for, with permitting, so any modifications to the exterior buildings out on the street, but the hub is not in that district. Um, Even though it's visible from it, it has no. Right, right. Any other questions? Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Fari, and I'm the. Uh, I'm sorry. The question got off. Oh, it, can you hear now? Is that better? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I'll hold it close to uh, my mouth. I'll try not to shout. Um, my name is Michelle Fari. I have the pleasure of serving um, in the Department of Health and Human Services as the Deputy Commissioner, and I've been with the city for about eight years or more now. And Commissioner O'Leary is here in the audience, and we're very happy to be discussing the Resilience Hub as a much needed asset and resource here in the city. Um, I'm going to try and move pretty quickly. I brought a lot of material because I realize some folks might be familiar with what we do at the DHHS and some folks might not be as aware of the variety of things that we offer. So, let's see here. I just skipped a slide. Um, the DHHS has some guiding principles and missions that we look to achieve in promoting the health and prevention and wellness for our entire community. So we look to empower people, we look to um, effectively communicate and promote equity in all of the different spaces and places that people are in our community. We have a lot of capacity at the DHHS. We do a lot with academic and university partnerships. And here on the slide, you're seeing that right now we currently have a partnership with the UMass Medical uh, Chen School. We have four uh, intern students who are studying to become physicians in community-based health. And we have uh, two interns here tonight, one of them who contributed quite a bit to uh, research relating to the Resilience Hub and different models across the country and that's part of the APHC and Mount Holyoke College. Um, for the social drivers of health, and I'll connect back because I moved a little quickly there. I think I was missing a slide. We have six divisions in the Department of Health and Human Services. One of our divisions is environmental health and inspection, so all of the regulatory work that falls within a health department. We have a prevention division, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a future slide. It does a lot of work, um, and we've been known for our regionalization of substance use and um, opioid overdose response programs. We have our Division of Community Care, which we're very excited to be in the future home of the Resilience Hub soon. And our operations will be based out of the Resilience Hub, which is a new layer of public health and emergency services and the first in the state of Massachusetts autonomously um, to be out of public health. We also have public health nursing, which works locally here in the city and regionally. We have our emergency preparedness division, which serves as a coalition, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well in relationship to the Resilience Hub and federal and local emergencies that we experience. And I want to make sure I didn't forget a division because it's sometimes easy to overlook with our six, but I think I got everybody. Um, at the DC, DHHS, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is considering all of the strategies and um, promotion for health to embody equitable practices. And when I was recently talking with the Board of Health about um, the social determinants of health, which has become a much more common um, familiar phrase for people, it's really thinking about <laughs> any possible way that you may have inherited certain equities, inequities, as well as experience them throughout your life. And those can change. And we know that equity can obviously vacillate depending on climate resilience and um, impact. We know it can um, 
impact us related to economic hardships as well as access to care, as well as care meaning health care and social emotional wellness and care, and the variety of things. I can almost attribute anything that happens in our life to public health, and I kind of drive my friends and family crazy because I'm like, that's public health. We were watching the Bruins the other night, and I'm like, that's public <laughs> health. I want to talk about the data and statistics. But one of the shifts that we've seen of late is really in thinking about equity and the social determinants of health phrasing. There's been a lot of rethinking about how we even predispose the way we think about the determinants as if something you had control over, which often you don't, um, and things happen to us all. We know that we can't anticipate um, and we aren't able to mitigate. So we're kind of looking at the shift in the social drivers of health. What drives and impacts people's lives in the way they live, work, and move through systems? Um, I added a slide here um, with some local data, and there's a lot of small numbers and information, and this will be available to you after as a PowerPoint slide, as well as um, translated in Spanish. What I did want to kind of touch on that's not quite honed in here exactly, because I wanted to make sure you felt we comprehensively could show you some demographics on Northampton, was thinking about the poverty rate, which was actually brought up by an audience member, I think Senate um, uh, Councilor Labarge, um, thinking about of those that are experiencing a below um, poverty rate average than the state of Massachusetts, we actually have 25.5% of people who also identify as having a disability. And if we put that in perspective, that is a quarter of the population that is walking around here in the city of Northampton at any point in time that's living below the poverty rate, which means they have less access generally speaking, to the same things that someone within the average mean would, and have a compounded disability. So when you think about equity and you think about designing principles, practices, initiatives, um, interventions, we really have to think about making those as low barrier, accessible as possible, and inclusive. And when you think about inclusivity, it means that we're thinking about people's language, the way they need to physically, and with their mobility be able to access, and cognitively. So I just want to name that because a lot of the barriers that people experience are invisible barriers. Things that we can't see, we're not aware of, and we can't always anticipate what a need is. So when we think about equity, we have to think about what we can't see, but what we know and we're able to in the Department of Public Health really comprehensively look at data that comes from our state and federal um, resource level, but we have the ability with our programs and our regional operations to be able to really drill those down locally, think about those impacts, and come up with case scenarios or case examples that we can then um, help inform the design of this important project. So with that in mind, I just want to shift us to thinking about how people access care, especially at the time of an emergency. So we all have had an emergency where we didn't know what we were going to do, we didn't know how we were gonna access care, and depending on our social driver, social determinant of health perhaps, do we have health insurance? Do we have a phone available to us? Do we have mobility? Do we have transportation? How are we going to get help in a crisis-like situation, an urgent, imminent, need like an emergency. This just came out and I recommend everyone in the audience, I thought it was fascinating, maybe it's just me, but um, the state went ahead and created something called the Massachusetts Healthcare Policy Commission. It is a special body of individuals who are thinking critically, and this was especially important during times of COVID, at how people access care, their vulnerabilities, and where Really, we know there are significant deficits. All of us have struggled probably to make a primary health care appointment. We know our appointments available for our pediatric and children are often at a premium, and they're very hard to get. If you have to cancel, you're in trouble trying to reschedule. But there you are as a person, imagine yourself, who's facing a more significant obstacle. You don't have a car. You might not have a phone. You might not be able to have a 
um, advocacy type conversation with what you need um, and how are you going to access that care. And we're fortunate we have Chief Pilas here from the fire department, um, which is also our EMS provider here in Northampton, and they're doing an incredible amount of good work getting people to the hospital, getting people emergency care, and they do it with a lot of compassion and love here in Northampton. And I have to say, I was quite stunned in watching this presentation the Mass Healthcare Policy Commission just came out with, saying that despite all of this amazing and very challenging capacity we have in emergency services, there is still a very significant percentage of people that end up finding themselves at the emergency department through Ubers, through friends, through Lyfts, through multiple different ways if you can drive yourself, if you're having an emergency and can still get there, which sometimes that, ha that happens at a rate of 70% or more in Massachusetts. And I kind of found that to be surprising. So if you think about, we know there's this incredible capacity on our EMS and emergency services. And then there's 70% more people going to the emergency department. Is there enough emergency department staff? Is there enough providers? Are there enough inpatient beds? Um, you know, the layers of things when it gets into disability and other compounding um, health and um, cognitive disorders and, dis and conditions, vulnerabilities, um, those that have been made marginalized, you really struggle to have your needs met. And if you can't maintain um, and be able to do follow-ups, if you can't advocate for yourself, if you don't have stable housing to have mail sent, you also face these additional challenges. And so where we see um, individuals within our community really struggling to have their basic needs met, it is where we hope the Resilience Hub is going to start to fill some of those gaps for what we know our community really cares about. And the reality is in the data as we've looked at emergency services data, a dominant amount of emergency calls come from third-party bystanders. That means someone that is unrelated to you, that is not going to you, that you're concerned about or perhaps you're feeling uncomfortable with or uncomfortable for. And if that is the case, and especially in Northampton, because we have a lot of caring residents, a lot of people paying attention in our city, we want to see those people receiving the resources they need, and that is the dream of this resilience. I want to just give a um, credit to an incredible part of the planning process that happened to inform this particular project, which I think is very unique from what I've been able to assess so far in the hard work of the internship um, effort, is that there was a project called Arc Epi, which is a combination of architectural design and epidemiology. And of course, it, you know, for someone like myself, and I know um, Carolyn and Glad from CAPV, we all had the pleasure of seeing a presentation for a dissertation project um, for Adele Houghton, Houghton um, who was phenomenal at taking a plethora of publicly available data sets, putting them together, and a report, and I brought it up here just to show you, um, you know, double page printed, is, is very thick, um, that gave so much context to the landscape of what particularly in Northampton we could gather from census data or CDC data. And that also was very early in the process to help say, we need this, and we need this with X, Y, and Z, and then how are we gonna get there? And our role in the DHHS is to bring that local context. And we are very much enjoying the collaborative process with all the stakeholders that are involved. And this is a picture of Dory um, giving that presentation when we were all there. But the important part of just having this as a slide with the limited amount of time to share with you was that the group of individuals who attended this project um, reveal at a conference all had a variety of backgrounds, but found it so relevant. And we did an exercise walking through the room thinking about um, what were the particular areas, assets, deficits, challenges, and um, different ways we could vision um, the hub being um, inserted within the entire community. So serving everyone, of course, with a special focus on our most vulnerable, but then also being a place and space where anyone in the community could find themselves um, feeling valued and, and part of a community. 
Um, really fast, I'm going to move through these slides, but when developing our Division of Community Care, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the data related to that, we were tasked with doing a very rigorous assessment and evaluation with the public health approach we were um, taking on, and we were very much proud of that charge that we wanted to inform the work. And one of the things the UMass Center of Program Evaluation, who is our evaluation and research partner, did is they went all around the city of Northampton using a mi mixed methods um, gathering of information which involved data as well as open responses. So they call that qualitative data. I can provide lots of qualitative data as you can see. I can talk a lot um, and give a lot of feedback and opinions. But then also they had certain standardized data sets. And so they did an evaluation, and I'm really proud of what they did. It was kind of surprising to us at the DHHS, the level of rigor they um, approached the work with by not only disseminating through online, um, as well as this QR code, flyers, postering, putting with key stakeholders and partner organizations throughout the city, but as well doing a street level, what they call intercept survey. So stopping people and asking them if they would answer a few questions quickly. Um, and for the city of Northampton, you know, we have a good foot traffic downtown. They decided to also go up on King Street to see if they could look at the difference between people that utilize the city, work in the city and downtown, and also more likely residents near Stop and Shop. <laughs> um, so what they found in the amount of people they were able to survey, and maybe I didn't see it there, but I want to go back. How many people? I'm sorry to be flipping through here. They had over, let's see, how many, I can't read it, I don't have my glasses up. Thank you, 475 responses. I didn't want to give the wrong um, data number. That's a lot of people to give information about this um, new dream of the Division of Community Care that has come online in harmony and parallel with the Resilience Hub mission. And 56% of the survey participants had previously heard about the DCC, and I can tell you it's not on this slide. This wasn't the focus when I pulled this for our presentation tonight, but also we're aware of the Resilience Hub. We have quite a bit of qualitative conversations knowing these one of two things were happening. And then many of them identified with a variety of race and ethnicity, as well as age, which was really important because what they found was in gathering community information, and this is important for us to think about for the hub moving forward as well, is that they were able to gather a much higher rate of individuals over 40 years old, 38 or so, and up online, and then they found much more success reaching um, people younger than 40 years old through that um, intercept methodology. But they really did find some really important things that validated at the time, but also I think helped um, give us some of the blueprint and what we knew this Division of Community Care and Hub uh, work might look like, which was helping individuals where there was a public disturbance, whether they were involved or the bystanders themselves, for people living in abandoned buildings or spaces or places that aren't currently habitated, um, bathing in public restrooms or fountains. And I know from my time here at the city, we did an incredible amount of work in the city hall bathrooms, installing the locks boxes and different kinds of prevention methods because we knew people used the bathrooms as a critical resource and they didn't get locked, we kept them unlocked. And then um, sleeping on the sidewalk or public outdoor space. This is very common in many urban landscapes where people are just looking to rest in a place to be. And the common perception is always um, the person may be experiencing a difficult time or difficult moment, but sometimes being in public space feels safer than being invisible and not visible. And so we want that Resilience Hub piece to be where people can be seen and they can be valued and they can interact and feel a sense of community and safety. Also, um, the use of substances. This is an issue of concern nationwide and it is happening here in Northampton. And we have lots of initiatives at the DHHS helping people that are impacted by substance use. Other things that we were thinking about were how could we um, really acknowledge what has been somewhat partitioned in the way that we've made certain approaches towards high risks and vulnerabilities with people prior to COVID to post-COVID, things have changed. Um, a lot of the strategies that we were deploying for overdose responses that were really focused primarily on substance use of concern 
we now see complexities in the way that those things can vacillate from day to day in an individual with behavioral health as well as substance use conditions. And then thinking about trauma. I haven't said that word yet. I promised myself I wouldn't say it a hundred times. But what we know is that people experience trauma and they experience trauma in different ways throughout their lives and the way that that impacts their health their wellness and their ability to function and have a meaningful, engaging life within the city, we hope the Resilience Hub can still um, also be considered to be addressing of past and um, potentially mitigating future trauma. Um, the one thing we also feel really strongly about with the connection to the Division of Community Care, DCC, and the Resilience Hub is we really value those that have been marginalized. And of the data that I could have talked more about, we have about an 80% um, demographic of individuals who identify as white in Northampton. We have a very significant population that is older than the statewide or national average. We have a lot of people that are stably housed, a lot of people that fall within the average economic um, ability. And what we do know in the data that we have, and we're working very hard on data equity to get better at not othering people within data is to look at those vulnerabilities more specifically based on race, gender, ethnicity in a more nuanced way so that interventions are targeted <coughs> and programming at the Resilience Hub will really think about all people within the community and not based on the majority, based on the minority that we know are more disproportionately. Things that the DHHS and we hope um, to work really closely with our um, community partners and community action that's taken a lot of work and effort to think about um, critical issues for many years in their nonprofit organizational role and reach, we hope to complement and bringing that hub and spoke model, not to be cliche, but really the hub is going to be a nucleus with a lot of different services all in a one-stop shop, so to speak, so getting people will be more efficient to an expert provider in their care needs as well as the care continuum and making sure people can stay within the multiple different variety of services the hub will be designed to deploy. Also, food as a basic necessity is a critical element. A lot of times it's, it's hard to imagine, but emergencies occur in distress over hunger, lack of sleep, lack of uh, safety. Those are the primary beliefs that we have the hub will be able to address on a consistent and um, routine way for people to feel a predictable safety in their life and a catchment in this variety of services as they're defined and identified. But many of the things that we do at the DCC is to be an expert in the care providers that would best align with an individual. A lot of our um, most vulnerable populations have either been discontinued with other providers or they may have not been able to maintain whatever regulation or responsibility or even paperwork and documentation that might be needed. So our job, and we believe that will bring the hub um, some of that critical infrastructure is to be an expert at helping to identify what people need and being an assistant to helping people get back into care when they fall off that um, spectrum. I thought it would be interesting and relevant just to highlight when we did do an assessment of the emergency services data, the most striking um, thing that happened to come for us was the um, geospatial location analysis of where the expected highest level of DCC type services and responses would be occurring in Northampton. And it isn't surprising that it would be more adjacent to downtown because we have a lot more activity downtown. But what was really striking was how close it is to where the Resilience Hub and our mayor's office was so thoughtful in identifying an area that would be accessible to transportation, to other types of providers and businesses, as well as being visible. So again, I just want to keep saying that word visible. The Resilience Hub isn't, you know, five blocks tucked away. It's really, it's right here on Main Street. It's right here where we want people to see and embrace our values as part of the city 
and the way that we want to treat all people with equity. Um, just to highlight a little bit about our prevention division, because they have done so much good work um, to help DHHS over the years develop and grow as we have, is we have our Hampshire Hope Coalition, which we're fortunate to have a coordinator in the room today that is not only serving here in Northampton, but across the county. Um, critical Things Hampshire Hope works very hard are around advocacy, organizing partners, looking for risks and trends that people are facing, especially when we know substance use is an evolving landscape of a variety of risks for people. And we have an amazing youth coalition. I put a second slide just so you could take a peek at their work. Um, one of the things that Dory and I were discussing and we are trying to trim slides, was you know making sure youth are included and visible as part of this project. Predominantly, we know it's more the adults we're concerned about on the city of Northampton streets, but I can assure you there are a lot of vulnerable youth, and there are a lot of vulnerable youth that believe Northampton is a safer place to be. And that is important that we know that as a community, that we give that um, projection to Western Mass as being a safer community and we want youth to feel that they know where they can go to seek safety and support as well. And then we have a regional program called the Drug Addiction Recovery Team that was born as a response out of the Hampshire Hope Coalition's work that brings law enforcement and um, peer work all throughout Western Mass. It's an amazing program and um, the North Hampton Recovery Center is here in the audience and I just want to acknowledge that because we could not have done this work without um, the peer and people with lived experience helping to inform and um, refine the way that we approach helping people. This is just a photo of the um, Youth for Equity in Action. They just actually renamed themselves um, and they had um, some amazing photo uh, voice exhibits. There was two where the students took pictures around health and equity as well as hosted a harm reduction workshop at the high school. They do an incredible amount of active, um, I wouldn't want to say activism, but they're just a, a great um, critically thinking um, young and emerging champions in our community. Um, other areas, and I want to round this out because I'm sure I'm at 15 minutes, I was supposed to put my timer on, um, is emergency preparedness. Um, we know that the Resilience Hub and a lot of resilience hubs, a lot of resilience hubs across the country, are based on climate resilience, which is an incredibly impactful issue that you know definitely affects our health, it affects our mental health, it affects our um, quality of life. We've had many um, instances of flooding in this past year in the city, but the critical thing is we did have one period where there was a federal designation, I believe that was hard fought for and affected some of our communities um, a little bit east, um, in our farming communities especially, but here in Northampton we tend to have a lot of um, non-federally designated emergencies. And what that means is that we don't get resources from the government, from the state, to address these issues. So as a city, we are doing the best that we can with the resources we currently have on hand. And that's what's pretty amazing about the resilience of Northampton in general, is our community mobilizes. We have Nana Community Kitchen that has done incredible amounts of um, addressing people's food insecurity during COVID, and especially in these times of emergencies, helping our unhoused, helping people move, and the Division of Community Care, as it's been on board for the past eight months, has really felt passionate that it is also an issue that we should be involved in, and we have. And it's been a beautiful thing to see people believe that they have resources, a variety of resources now that are developing that will be all together in this pub space, that can help people when they lose their belongings to flooding, when they don't have a safe space to be, when there is really, really difficult hardships with the heat and with finding um, you know, cooling centers, and we've used the DCC space in that way, and the Resil Resilience Hub will be that too. So you know, heat and cooling, those are social equity issues. People have the right
to feel warm. People have the right to be able to cool off and get a bottle of water. And we will be able to mobilize and deploy those non-federal designated emergencies as well as federally designated emergencies. So there's a lot of big plans for what that will look like, and some of those things will be determined by the building and what we can do. But one of the pieces we know is that the hub and the ways we've mobilized federal and major emergencies, um, we hope to be one of our um, strongholds that can be online and can be a staging ground to deploy resources and as well um, deliver resources to people. So there'll be a lot in the design process to come that will flush out exactly what those will be. But last I wanted to talk about the inspectors and um, our health department does a lot of regulatory work and it's not the things that get the attention, generally speaking. Um, when we're out talking and people want to hear about the role and things that we want to do and work with people on. But this year, our housing inspectors decided to start tracking how when housing complaints or um, inspections are requested and need to occur, when they believe someone would be appropriate for a potential referral to the Division of Community Care. So we've had 67 complaints so far this year, which is fairly on par, I believe, maybe a little high, but not under average for us, is my, my best understanding asked for this data very last minute, I'll be honest. Um, but of those 67, already 10 different individuals were identified as being a really good cross-referral within our different divisions within the DHHS. And there could be a variety of reasons, and I wouldn't want to um, make any claims on exactly what those are. I'll get back to you, I promise, with more data and information related. But they could be things like mental health they could be things like distress. Um, a lot of times intersect with our elders. There's a lot of vulnerability around our elder populations right now, and we've talked about a lot of people and populations, but our elders living alone, and a lot of times um, in their later life, uh, subsidized housing or group homes or settings where a lot of complaints come in, and they actively are pursued and investigated for any rights and regulatory needs. We know that a lot of it has to do with even cognitive functions that we lose with age. So it could be memory impairment, things like um, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. People really need support. They need connection. They need to know where to go and where they can and should be. And that is really what we hope um, to see the vision for the resilience of. So I'm happy to take any questions, but I probably went at time. But we are right down in City Hall, and we also, our main offices are um, in the Roundhouse while we await the Resilience Hub to come online. The Commissioner and I have an open door policy. We really value our community members' needs, their input, their feedback, what they're concerned about. Please reach out to us. We're happy to explain and give any supplemental information. So when I think about climate issues, right, we kind of have three, three areas where we need to act, need to act in, for mitigation. And this project addresses that as part of the city's 2030 goal of operating with uh, zero carbon emissions. So we're trying to reduce our impact on the climate or the, you know, slow emissions. That's an important component. Then there's adaptation, right? There's a certain amount of climate change that is just coming is already here. And so we have um, uh, extreme hot days, also some extreme cold days. So you remember these polar vortices, right? That That is actually a function of global warming. So we have some extreme periods where people who are exposed, people who don't have, sh have shelter, need a place to go. It means we need a place that's got cooling, heating, hot water, laundry, you know, what, what's in the home. So that's part of the city's approach to adaptation. And then the next part is preparation. 
because we know we're not going to get just kind of extreme weather, but we're also going to get emergencies. And what I want to point out is, oh, I, here we go. I didn't have to put that slide there. So, right, so mostly we're providing adaptation for a relatively, a, a population that is not the majority of, of, of the population here, but who are extremely needy of those adaptations being available. And then those emergencies happen, right? So we get major floods, we get heat waves, uh, and maybe heat waves that coincide with a power outage, right? Or destructive storms and whole neighborhoods, or whole portions uh, of neighborhoods, people have to have, to have some place to go, and they need heat or cooling or hot, and hot water and kitchens and showers and laundry, right? They need all those things. And all of these things can happen and often do happen with power outages. So the hub is a safe place for people to go in those emergencies for all those, all those needs. And so one of the mitigation factors is having a highly efficient envelope. Oh, and the other factor that I forgot to mention is we need to provide fresh air. If you want to put a whole bunch of people in, in space, we need a lot of air changes so that we don't spread diseases amongst each other, right? So we can do that in an efficient way or an inefficient way. And traditionally, in large buildings, we've done it in a really inefficient way, which is to say we suck in a lot of fresh air, it's too cold or too hot or too humid, and we have to condition it, and we use energy to do that. And then once we've finally done that, we turn it over and we send it outside with an exhaust fan. <laughs> so the hub, Part of the design is a balanced uh, energy recovery ventilation system. And the other thing, this is on the mitigation side, is if we use the most efficient heat pump that we can get, which in most cases is a ground source heat pump. So we're just exchanging, we're basically scavenging heat from the earth. Mm -hmm. It's really solar heat that's been stored. Um, but we can do that at extremely high efficiency which means we don't need a lot of electricity to do it. And that's important because it reduces our emissions, yay, right? But in an emergency, it allows us to have a fixed storage, right? The generators are expensive, batteries are expensive, however, we're storing energy. So in this case, if we had, this is just kind of doing the math for you, right? If we had a thousand kilowatt hour battery, or that's equivalent to a generator with 125 gallons of diesel, Right, so that's what we have. Well, if we have an air-cooled air conditioning system, something like a, a, a VRF system, don't need to get into details, something that uses efficiently air-cooled, we get about half a day on that storage system. And then, if the power's still out, too bad. But if we have a ground source heat pump, which is just that much more efficient, especially in cooling, we actually get just over 24 hours. Now, if we also have enthalpy recovery ventilators, so that's basically we're taking back some of the energy, or in this case, it's in cooling mode, so we're rejecting heat and we're rejecting moisture passively as we ventilate, we can extend that to, uh, what did I calculate, about 30, 33 hours, which may get us through, really gets us through the duration of most power outages. So you could pack a lot of people, right? Because that's actually, I, I picked a pretty high uh, cooling load, uh, 114 tons cooling load, that's, that's a lot of people. So we can pack a lot of people in there and hope that the power outage is done in 12 hours. Or with geothermal, which is helping us all year round, be really efficient with the mitigation stuff. In the emergency, it allows a reasonable sized generator or a reasonable sized battery to allow us to coast for a while. ERVs are even better in, or at HRVs, whichever, heating recovery ventilators in winter. So what if we have a power outage and it's cold out? So I'm old enough and lived here long enough that I remember the 2011 Halloween snowstorm um, my in-laws from Arkansas were staying with me. Um, and, uh, I mean, we, we had a house, and, and we, you know, and we, like a lot of people, were able to stay warm-ish. And, and, you know, we could 
eke out a few showers before it was too late, you know, all that stuff. But in the hub, let's say you have a bunch of people who need to go someplace. They maybe need to charge their phones, so it needs to be a place that has some power. They need um, a, a place to maybe operate a kitchen. Maybe that they have all electric kitchens, um, or uh, there are various reasons why, why you, you might not be able to do some of the basic things that you need to do. So you want to get a bunch of people there. And they all need fresh air, right? So humans put out about three, 356 BTUs per hour. Uh, yes, we're using freedom units um, I, I, per person. And the ventilation requirements for each person, let's say, is about 10 cubic feet per minute. Um, uh, so that results in 464 BTUs per hour required to, to replace the heat. If you're throwing in all that fresh air, you need to heat it up. That particular winter was about, the average was about 25, that event was about 25 degrees. So if this event had happened and we had the hub. So if we don't have a, a heat recovery ventilation, which remember we put there so that we have less carbon emissions, right? Our overall performance is just, we don't spend a lot on energy, right? We need to supply 108 BTUs per people. So let's say we allocated 30 kilowatt hours of that storage from the other slide. Well, we get about 18 hours before we're gonna have trouble heating up that air. But if we're recovering the heat that those people are expelling and, and we're recovering it on the ventilation air, at 75% efficiency, we actually are still supplying 240 BTUs per person. Each person is supplying free to the hub 240 BTUs that we don't need for ventilation heating. So if we have a well-insulated building, which we do, we can actually coast kind of indefinitely with is, well, I mean, we still have to be able to run the fans, but that's a much, much lower load than providing heat or cooling. So this technology, which costs a little bit of money and you have to plan for, enables this hub to become a long-term emergency uh, facility, while also, of course, saving us energy and, and money and all that stuff in operating. Um, the other thing that's important is the location. So we could, find ourselves in a situation where there's flooding, where there are street closures, um, where um, there's a power outage. You can't run the pumps at the gas station. So you might need to walk or ride your bike to get some place for a shower or food, you know, food and, you know, comfort things. Well, turns out, we're actually fairly dense, so if you look at some of the sustainability metrics that, uh, say, a uh, um, planning uh, department looks at, such as density, well, our density is actually helping to make the hub and its location a really good sustainability move, but it also makes the hub really good in the kinds of emergencies, especially power outages, because this circle shows you two miles from, from downtown. And that's most people living in Northampton. This is four miles. I, I live just outside of that, and I've biked uh, to town and back and to town, and I'll be going back just today. It's not a big deal. <laughs> we have, you know, it's really easy to do, and we're lucky about that. So that means that this location is rapidly accessible without vehicles. So the issue of parking, right, which we've con concerned about, may not be that big of an issue in an emergency, right? And in not an emergency, we've got parking. And that way, and I'm sure uh, Chief Pulis will, will talk about it, that way we can keep accessibility for emergency vehicles, coming and going and, and possibly even supplying people. Um, that's it, thank you. For Ben, Dan, does anyone have any questions for our, our new? Uh, yes. How many people can you pack in there? Can you pack in? Uh, occupancy is calculated a lot of different ways based on whether you're standing them, sitting them, or lying them down, basically. Uh, so it would depend. Um, 
Uh, we have, in terms of uh, cots, for instance, that sanctuary space that we're calling the community hall, uh, very loosely and comfortably, that could suit 30 cots in an emergency. Um, standing uh, occupancy in that room, it's about a 2,000 square foot room divided by, you know, so the, just, just to give you a, a sense of the overall. Um, what did you say, 30 cots? Yeah. That's, that's it. The, we've just, we were helping the, um, our uh, rescue and fire imagine what it would be like if we had a use of the facility in an emergency. And I can actually put, put Andy in here. He's already looking. How you doing? Uh, Andy Peel is fire chief and emergency manager for the city of North Um it, we, I can speak, I, I would say we could, without, you know, off the record, I would say we could hold more cots than just 30. Um, during the pandemic, um, we took over the Northampton High School gymnasium and we had 55, Meredith? I believe 55 cots that were separated even farther than we normally would just because of the potential of uh, getting COVID. So I don't know the exact size of the space, but I will comfortably say we'll get more than 33. I would say we would get between 50 and 75, um, just looking at the pr preliminary blueprints. Um, <clears throat> what's that? I'm just saying that already So I was, you know, some of the key components that we look for uh, having an emergency shelter is electricity is one. Um, everybody needs to charge their phones nowadays, um, we found that out that it was a, a big problem uh, at the shelter initially is not having enough chargers to charge phones. Um, generator, uh, loss of power as Ben was saying, um, with, with loss of power we need electricity, we need to cool, we need to heat, um, that, that's very important uh, for an emergency shelter. Um, as I said, heat, air conditioning, food, water, showers. Laundry was something we learned by trial and error. <laughs> Most emergency shelters are open for five to seven days um, for, for flooding, for, for loss of electricity. We found out during the pandemic that we were open for over three months and showers and the laundry was a huge issue. We had no, we ended up having to shuttle people to laundry mats to do their laundry. It was, it was not a uh, very practical uh, way of doing laundry. Um, cots, as we were saying, we have we, the plan is to have storage there so we can have the cots stored there. Currently, right now, for the regional shelter, which is at North, uh, Smith Vocational, Smith, uh, Smith Volk has a trailer that we can access that has all the cots and stuff but it takes people, it takes time to get the cots set up. If we did have this hub, we could certainly store some of that material there, which would make it easier for us when we needed to set it up. Uh, ADA compliant, I know uh, that's a very important thing. This is uh, ADA compliant, so we won't have any issues there. Um, and it also, you know, the discussion is, is animals. Everybody has animals. Ideally, we, with the, um, Oh, Hampshire Emergency Animal Response Team, they work with us at the uh, Smith Vocational School and we would look for them to uh, assist us here at the shelter because a lot of people don't like to go to shelters because they don't want to leave their animals. And if they have to leave their animals, they're not going to go. So um, that is a key component to this. That's about all I have. Does anybody have any questions for, for me? And I can say, just on the, the Halloween, uh, I was working that day, and it was, there, over half of the city had no power. And we actually did open up a shelter, and we had one person show up. So it's kind of interesting that um, you do have this shelter open, and for some reason, I think people tend to not want to, maybe it's not inviting for them, and or maybe they're just worried that there's going to be, I, I don't know, but it was very interesting to us that we opened up, we had like 50 cots set up and nobody ended up showing up except one person. So maybe 
if this is a really inviting and great place, it, people will be more comfortable during an emergency to come there and stay warm or uh, stay cool. Thank you. So do we have any, it's getting late, do we have any other questions anyone has uh, for tonight? If not, I'd like to actually ask a lot if you could talk about our next session a little bit and, and hopefully you can invite others, bring others along and we can carry this conversation further. Thank you so much, Dory, and to all of the presenters today. Um, on June 5th, right here at the same place, same time, um, there's going to be another meeting, a uh, public meeting, where we're going to have a bunch of different service providers and folks will be offering services and resources at the Hub here to speak about what services they're going to provide, how they'll all integrate, how we're coordinating with one another at the Hub, and what that means for the types of supports that we're able to provide for our whole community. So I know we've talked a lot about the emergency preparedness aspects of the building, the architecture and design, and in this third meeting, we're really going to get into more of the services and some of the resources that are available there, which I know is some of the um, really most uh, relevant parts in terms of addressing community needs right here locally. Um, and we'll have a number of, of local organizations to speak about their work and how it'll be impacted at the Hub. So we hope you'll all be able to come back and, and bring folks with you on June 5th. Any other, any other final questions? Thank you all for coming out here and being here.